Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stuff I Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio. And today we're taking a bit of a break. It wasn't intentional from the, the dark news of the day uh, to talk about mountaineering. And not to say that we aren't going to talk about some dark things. Um, so I guess this is your content warning. I think it's nothing major, but we are going to be talking about death in mountaineering. Um, and so this kind of came about because <laughs> I recently went down a mountaineering rabbit hole because of a free Paramount Plus trial. I could go into the details. I won't. But basically, I ended up watching a lot of documentaries about mountaineering. (laughs) I have so many mountaineering facts. I'm very surprised I did not bombard you with them the last time we hung out because I've the last few times I've been out with people and I've had a couple drinks, I'm like, do you know about the death zone? It's it's ridiculous. Um, BT Doves. Paramount Plus is not a sponsor for they this. They are not Just a so sponsor. You know. <laughs> not currently, not currently. But hey, Paramount Plus, I mean, here hey, we are. I need a subscription, <laughs> so if you want to. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I'm such a cheapskate. When I get the free trial, I watch things I would never watch otherwise. Right. And this is how this happened. I wouldn't have watched these documentaries otherwise. I did enjoy them, uh, okay. clearly. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you're like, guess what? We're going to do an episode of Mountain Dew. And I was like, oh, okay. Here we go. And I was like, have you heard about the death zone? And you were like, what? You did not ask me that. <laughs> yes, but you were surprised when I told you that I'd been on this mountaineering rabbit hole. <laughs> not as surprised because your mind is unique and likes Thank to go you. down mountains, I'm sure. Likes to go down mountains. My <laughs> mind is unique. Thank you. And I actually have been mountaineering. Um, okay. Not in anything like this that we're specifically going to talk about, but I have climbed, uh, I have had to deal with acclimatization and uh, altitude poisoning, actually. Oh, Uh, wow. Of course. Oh, it's horrible. Don't recommend it. Um, (laughs) But I watched these documentaries, and I couldn't stop thinking about the mindset of climbing a mountain when the death rate is 1 in 4, which is what it is for K2, I think. Oh, look, my mountaineering facts, they're coming to use. Here Um, we go. However, I do want to point out because a lot of mountaineers, I really don't want to do you injustice if you're listening, say that, like, statistics numbers-wise, and we can argue about, like, the mindset specifically, but you're actually more likely to die in a car accident. But anyway, I think that's more of a numbers game than... And anyway, I'm getting... I'm, I'm already going <laughs> off trail. Um, but <laughs> when asked about, like, why would you climb Mount Everest, famous British, uh, Britishman George Lee Mallory... Uh, who was I, one of the first to summit, if not the first to summit, Mount Everest said, because it's there. And so here we are. Here we are talking about it. I feel like that's it. a lot of people, though, like really have this level of seeing it and like, yes, I want, because it's not, it, it's dangerous and mm-hmm. it's, it's so like incredibly hard to train. People don't understand all of that. And it yeah. seems doable. So that's the other, I'm going to climb my Mount Everest or I'm going to climb Machu Picchu, like all of these like amazing destinations without understanding the true, like behind the scenes of it. Just doing the AT trail, the Appalachian mm-hmm. trail is pretty difficult, but it's not the level as you know, again, Mount Everest, Machu Picchu, mm-hmm. like that, there's a whole different level of mindset. But it seems attainable because if you mm-hmm. can walk, for those who are able-bodied enough to walk or even access a trail, yeah, it seems yeah. like this could be something. Yeah. Have you ever thought about it? I, I think I had actually said I was going to climb something. I forgot which one it is. I'm pretty <laughs> sure it wasn't Mount Everest, though, because I was like, I know better than that. Uh-huh. But... It, because I also love hiking and I yes. love going high. I feel like again, this is one of the things like I can walk, sure. So let me try mm-hmm. to do this. I love mm-hmm. hiking. I love seeing great views, and I don't mind uh, backpacking. Mm-hmm. So let's try this because I get, definitely can't rock climb. You know, I'm yeah. definitely not, well. I thought about skydiving, but that seems a little even more perilous in my head. Like all of that. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm sure I have. And you know, mm-hmm. it's kind of that old like midlife crisis. I'm going to climb on top of yeah. the mountain. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've thought about it, but never seriously. Um, Or at least Everest. Because I did do whatever, I can't even remember that mountain's name. But I have pictures and it it looks great. Um, (laughs) But but, um, I don't think I ever seriously considered it. And that surprises a lot of people when I tell them, because I guess I'm kind of like, 
I'm making like a, a finger gun <laughs> motion. I thought that was um, pizza. Oh, no, 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 no. It's finger guns. Excuse okay. you. I'm so sorry. Um, no. Oh, geez. So important. And we're going to talk <laughs> about, we're going to talk about a lot of accessibility issues. And of course, we're going to uh, keep this intersectional as we want to do. Uh, and because of that, like, I know people get really riled up about this. So I'm going to start with a lot of disclaimers. Okay. All right. Um, so we are not going to really touch on the environmental impacts and harm that the commercialization of mountaineering has done. But we do want to acknowledge that that is a big part of the conversation, and it should be. And also, never, ever, ever want to undervalue the work of the Sherpas and high-altitude porters who honestly make it possible for most folks in this commercialization space and have risked their lives and sometimes died. Especially when it comes to, yes, this capitalizing climbing of mountains and government policies that place profits over safety, but also the systems of poverty that might make that an option considered in the first place. This is not that podcast that does exist because I have listened to it. I have watched it. And I think that is an incredibly important part of all this. Um, and that's why we had to mention it at the top, even though that's not really what we're talking about today. Um, also want to mention plenty of indigenous peoples and regions with these mountains regularly transverse high altitudes Maybe not summiting, but worth mentioning because a lot of the people we're talking about are kind of like getting to the top, taking the picture, going down when other people might be doing it right. all the time or like something close. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that I've been seeing on social media slash uh -huh. TikTok is uh -huh. definitely a lot of Native Hawaiians being like, please stop doing this. You don't know what you're doing and you're causing yes. dangers and then becoming a whole risk and then having our people look like the enemies for telling you not to do this, and then yeah. also the enemies when we're like, we're not going to risk our lives because yes. you did something that we told you not to do. Yes. Yes. I mean, with everything we talk about, I would just encourage everyone to do your research and to be respectful. And yeah, there's a safety question in this, and you should take that very seriously because other people's lives and well-beings are on the line other than yours. Another thing worth mentioning, mountaineering is oftentimes, uh, but not always, uh, extremely inaccessible in terms of price of equipment and of travel. So that's something. And also, a lot of the stories about mountaineering and especially around tragedy in these situations are a bit muddled for a number of reasons, and we are going to talk about one specific case. Um, but so... Just keep that in mind. And final disclaimer, we are not experts. And please do not yell at us. I know commercial climbing really gets people angry, and I get it. Uh, we're doing more of a history of women uh, who have climbed mountains and also a current a look at what's going on right now. And also, we are sticking to basic mountaineering facts when it comes to the women we're talking about. So it could be they have something less than savory in their past. It could be that they're worth talking about more. And if you know more about that, please let us know, because clearly I'm eager for mountaineering facts. I'm like, just ready to receive them. <laughs> She's ready for trivia. Let's go. I am, I am, I am, I am. All right, so let's start with the definition. What is mountaineering exactly? Well, actually... Ha ha, it is not as simple as you think and is up for debate. Most seem to agree that it typically involves traversing snow and possibly ice and glaciers to reach a summit, which is called summiting. Others define it as scaling a mountain. Sometimes rock climbing does get roped into it. I think we're more specifically talking about summiting, ice, snow, glaciers involved, though. So would Tom Cruise be a mountaineer? <laughs> <laughs> the question of the podcast. I would love if I became like, you know how on trivia teams you have like your sports person, your like music person. I would love if I was You're like the mountaineer person. <laughs> <laughs> I bet he is. Yes, I bet he well, is. Well, I just wonder because I just remember that picture of him like hanging from yep. the edge. And I know that that's free climbing essentially, mm -hmm. but that, I'm guessing it's probably roped up into this. Um, mm -hmm. Again, people need to be trained. 
I yes. cannot emphasize this enough. People yes. really do things on a silly idea and yeah. not researching it heavily. Please don't mm-hmm. do this. Uh, so, of course, numbers are sort of hard to track. Uh, but according to some data from the Outdoor Industry Association, there are about 2 million climbers in the U.S. Um, and as far as women, we couldn't find a general number. But data from specific mountains indicates it ranges from 10 to 20 percent, but has been on the rise. Yes. Uh, And since the first known summit of Everest in 1953, only about 8% of those who have summited Everest have been women. Uh, Many women have reported misogyny and getting questioned at every turn. And I will say, researching this, I found a lot of troubling... I I have an anxiety around articles that go to a strictly biological sense of why things are the way they are. That makes me really, yeah, that makes me really nervous. Um, there are a lot about this. A lot of them say women and men evolved equally to be able to summit mountains. Um, and there were scientific articles about that, but I just felt really uncomfortable talking about it, to be honest. But they do exist. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so let's get into some history. And this one is kind of a mess. I'm going to be straightforward. It's kind of a mess. But I think we've we've got it wrangled up where it's, it's going to be <laughs> interesting. It's got quite a few intersecting threads. Um, so let's start with alpine mountaineering, which really took off during the 19th century. And the first men to complete these climbs captured the attention, awe, and ire of the public. So these alpine mountaineering... Perhaps I don't need to say it, but, you know, climbing mountains in the Alps. Uh, Women, they also climbed these peaks, though in lesser numbers, but with perhaps even more ire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for a long time throughout history, mountaineering has been traditionally and firmly in the domain of men. In fact, A.F. Mumry, a Victorian mountaineer, claimed that mountains have three phases they go through. The inaccessible peak, the most difficult ascent in the Alps, and a, quote, an easy day for a lady, <laughs> implying that once a woman climbs it, anybody can do it, and the mountain loses its allure, and it's no longer worthwhile. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. But Mummery himself knew that women could climb. He commented on Lily Bristow's 1893 climb of Grepon. Lucy Walker climbed the Matterhorn in 1871, only six years after a man made the first ascent. Mummery talked about that too. Uh, and his own wife, Mary, was a skilled climber. Together they climbed two Felsgrats uh, during a thunderstorm and something of a mountaining <laughs> I think I made that up, but now we're saying it. Mountaining legend. Uh, but in his mind, her participation lessened that accomplishment and the mountain itself. If a woman can do it, he thought, can't anybody. Um, so therefore, useless. And as we've discussed in multiple episodes, including our look at women in the Olympics, gym intimidation and a history of women exercising, the early 20th century is when younger middle class, typically white women, started playing certain sports, usually ones where it was believed it was possible to remain ladylike while playing them, a.k.a. you won't sweat and you can wear like a skirt. Um, As this was happening, male explorers were going to Antarctica and planning to summit Everest. Women and young girls not infrequently wrote to these explorers asking to join them on their endeavors. Women in this realm were often well-off and or unmarried and or ill. That whole mountain air thing, like go get some mountain air. Um, They were often in their 30s and 40s when they got their start. And many were husband and wife teams, but a lot were uh, sister teams or or friend teams. Women who did dare to climb mountains with the men often caused somewhat of an uproar. (laughs) For instance, when Bristow shared a tent with male climbers, people who knew her raised their eyebrows. On the other hand, when Gertrude Bell helped rescue some of her fellow male climbers, she was praised by the guide and others in the group. Women's clothing was still policed. Some women climbed in skirts, while others made news by climbing in pants. Wearing a skirt to climb was uh, pretty much always unsafe. So, like, while trying to summit the Matterhorn with her father in 1867, Felicite Carell's skirts kept catching dangerously in the wind until eventually she could go no further. The Matterhorn's Col Felicite is named for her. Many women would wear a dress from the hotel and then take it off at the bottom of the mountain to make climbing easier and safer, or some variation of that. Like, maybe they would take it off 
once they got started climbing, whatever, a climber named Mrs. Audrey LeBlonde, or Lizzie LeBlonde, once had to return to a summit uh, when on the descent, they realized, she realized she'd left her skirt there, so they'd go back up. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. Those damn scarves, the chafing alone. Oh, my the God. chafing alone, yeah. <laughs> No, thank you. Mm -mm. Um, So when the Alpine Club was founded in 1857, they did not allow women as members. Surprise. In response, women created the Ladies Alpine Club in 1907. LeBlanc served as the first president. Congratulations. And some did view mountaineering as somewhat of a feminist thing. Which is interesting. Some, Some viewed it as a feminist thing. Like, women can climb mountains too, but others viewed it as like... Look at those men climbing their mountains. <laughs> Silly. It's, it's interesting. Um, so we did want to talk about some famous women mountaineers and some famous uh, incidents involving women mountaineers. Again, this is really abbreviated and short. So if you are interested, I'm like, are there fellow interested mountaineering people out there? Uh, please let us know and we can do a whole episode on it. And we have mentioned some already, but we want to go over a few more. One is Fanny Bullock Workman, who was the first woman to ascend many peaks in the Himalayas, man or woman. In 1912, Bullock Workman was photographed in the Himalayas holding a sign that read, Votes for Women. And she had a nemesis, who I didn't include, who was also feminist, but they were nemeses, so that's interesting. Then there's Miriam O'Brien. After O'Brien was told she needed a man to show her where Summit was, she was infuriated and wrote, the one who goes up first on the rope has even more fun as he solves the immediate problems of technique, tactics, and strategy as they occur. I saw no reason why women, ipso facto, should be incapable of leading a good climb. They had, as a matter of fact, already done so on some few scattered occasions, but why not make it a regular thing on the usual climbs of the day? I decided to try some climbs, not only guideless, but manless. Um, By the 1920s, she followed up on this promise. She and other women, without the aid of men, completed many summits and many firsts. She even had an essay published in an edition of National Geographic titled Manless Alpine Climbing, which is actually where that quote is from. Manless Alpine Climbing. I feel like we need to do like a theatrical reading of this. Oh, you're speaking my language, Samantha. <laughs> I'm just saying, manless alpine climbing should be a reading for us. I, th- that's, I think that's a great username. <laughs> <laughs> so good, so good. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So then there's also Alma Wagen, Wagen, Wagen. All right, we're gonna say Wagen. Okay. And if someone knows, they're gonna correct me. I know they will, and I really want you to. Also, <laughs> fun fact: my great grandmother's name was Alma. Anyway, so she often gets the credit as the first woman mountain guide in North America. And in 1923, she said, quote, There were places to climb, and I wanted to teach other women the joy of climbing. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and then we have Arlene Bloom. Uh, Bloom led the first all-women ascent on Annapurna that was also the first successful American attempt in 1978. Oh, that's pretty recent. She was the first woman out of the U.S. to try her hand at climbing Mount Everest, and she was a member of the first all-women team to summit Denali. Yes, and my mountaineering fact, <laughs> Annapurna, I believe, has been and is still the most dangerous Mountain to summit. It has the highest death okay. rate. So it's oh, pretty. Goodness. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of, this is kind of the darker part. Where we're going to okay. talk about um, some death. I did want to include it because I hadn't heard about it. And that was sort of the point the article I was reading was making was like, this was a huge tragedy, but because of a couple of political things, but also because they were women, we don't hear about it. Uh, the whole right. team was women. Um, so just forewarning. In 1972, Elvira Chateveya organized the first all-women's climb of a 7,000-meter peak. And this was not by far her last time contributing to mountaineering history or her first time. Um, So, in June 1974, 170 climbers from several different countries came together in a mountaineering camp in the Pamir Mountains in the USSR, what is now the border of Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, many with the goal of climbing the over 7,000-meter Peak Lenin. This was a part of a USSR hosted international event, and many of the organizers were unsure about including women, but felt like having zero women wouldn't look good for them. 
Um, it was meant to foster a healthier relationship between the U.S. and the USSR and to promote mountaineering, especially to younger people. Most of the climbers were going to ascend or hoped to ascend the country's second highest peak uh, when an earthquake shook. Shaken in more ways than one, I did not mean to make that pun after the earthquake, American climber Molly Higgins reported turning a corner and seeing a Russian woman, Shadavea, uh, bossing around four Russian men. She turned to Higgins and said, I am Elvira Shadavea. I am master of sport. What are you? And master of sport was a top credential in USSR sport and rarely obtained by women at the time. Higgins later said, I thought it was great. I didn't want to be bossy like that, but here was a woman who really was capable. I wanted to be like her, that strong and that experienced. She was a heroine right there. Uh, by many accounts, the women of this expedition generally stayed on the Soviet side of the camp helped each other out. They practiced, they sang songs, they talked, they laughed, all while taking what they were doing very, very seriously. They didn't really argue or fight with each other. Uh, Shadavea wrote, you men have never dreamed of such openness. Another American who we just mentioned, Arlene Blum, um, remembers being welcomed by Shadavea after some politics that had her feeling left out of the American crew. Basically, they were like, you're not experienced enough to be here. You go over there. And Shadavea informed Blum that the male climbers didn't believe a woman's team could ever summit Pete Lennon. But that was Shadavea's goal. Her plan was to take a team of eight women to traverse the peak, the first to do so, no matter the gender, and biovac, which is basically extreme temporary camping on the top peak overnight. But of course... The weather was out of their control. Uh, the worst storm in a quarter decade raged, causing dangerous avalanche conditions, many of which would go on to kill several climbers. The day before the storm hit, organizers warned that serious weather conditions were impending, and they advised everyone to descend. The group of Russian women led by Shadavea were witnessed around 400 feet from the summit, about 122 meters, and they sent a message that they had, in fact, summited. So they did the thing. Um, the following day, they radioed again, informing organizers, one of whom was Shadavea's husband, of the issues that they were having. Winds of 70 to 80 miles per hour, temperatures as low as negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and a foot of snow made visibility virtually impossible. Shadavea reported that one of the women was sick and the other unwell. She was advised to descend and, if necessary, leave the sick women behind. As they started to descend, one of the women would tragically die, allegedly freezing to death as she held the rope for others to climb down. The survivors made it a few hundred feet before setting up tents. That night, or perhaps the next, uh, the two sick women died. The winds blew away much of their equipment, and the five surviving women took shelter in a tent without poles and only three sleeping bags. The next morning, some climbers who overheard the trouble the, the Russians were in tried to help, but weren't able to get far because of the weather. Shadavea informed organizers that three more of the women were sick and they could not leave them after everything they'd been through together and what they'd done for each other. A few hours later, she messaged, it is very sad here where it was once so beautiful. And within a few more hours, one of the women had died and Shadavea radioed, they are all gone now. That last asked, when will we see the flowers again? Two others earlier asked about their children. Now it is no use. A few hours later, we are sorry. We have failed you. We tried so hard. Now we are so cold. And a few hours later, another of the women had died. And then another. Shadavea told organizers she was too weak to hold down the transmit button anymore. And the final message came later from the remaining climber, Galina Parahodyuk. Now we are two, and now we will all die. We are very sorry. We tried, but we could not. Please forgive us. We love you. Goodbye. When the weather cleared, the American team started to ascend towards the peak, none the wiser. Higgins successfully summited, as did another American woman, the respected mountaineer Marty Hoey, who would later die on Everest in an attempt to become the first woman to summit in 1982. They, among other climbers that summited, found the bodies of the Russian women. In total, 13 died, including the eight women on that team. Uh, there were many reasons for this tragedy. One Higgins has suggested is they were the test group. They felt they needed to do it to uphold the standard of the women's team. And Blum said the women were so very loyal to each other. They stayed together until the end. 
So, uh, again, the article was making the point, like, this is a pretty serious tragedy um, in mountaineering history. And a lot of the tragedies that people can name and and, and successes people can name are about men. And this one has sort of been buried and people don't know about it. But it was an Mm all-women's team and they were the first to summit. um, But they didn't didn't survive it. Oh, goodness. Mm -hmm. Blum didn't go with them then. No, she was on, yeah, this was an all-Russian team. Blum was on the American team. She wanted to go with them, but uh, because of the, like, politics of it, they wanted it to be an all-USSR team. Yeah, that's really tragic. Mm-hmm. I feel like, though, there's definitely been movies on all male teams, or at least mostly yes. male teams, who have died. Mm-hmm. Um, and you hear horror stories, and then they are kind of elevated to, like, hero status. Sometimes, Yeah. <laughs> Typically, I've like, watched, like, oh, I mean, that's what tried. I'm talking about. I've watched them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, like, at this point, you know, this is really sad. They didn't make it. And then the, the loyalty they had to each other. Could have mm-hmm. been a movie. I feel like this has been a 90s movie. I feel I mean, maybe it exists. If listeners, maybe. Let, let us know. I don't right. think so, though. Because the, the whole point of the article was like, how the hell are, <laughs> we don't talk about this? <laughs> right. Of course, that has a lot to do with, like, mm-hmm. at that point, the USSR being... Yep. Uh, kind of the enemy of the state. I mean, today, we're not yeah. good, good standing with Russia. Uh-huh. So it's kind of that level, I'm sure, mm-hmm. which we don't know how much politics plays into it. And I wonder mm-hmm. how much, yeah, the USSR history sticks with the with, within Russia, like the former Soviet, all of that area. How much do they know? Do they actually know a lot of it? And we just, right. we don't know a lot of it, which mm-hmm. happens a lot when it comes to international stuff. Yeah, true. Uh, but uh, moving on to the... Less sad. Less sad. Yeah. Historical context. Um, uh-huh. We have uh, Junko Tabe, uh, who became the first member to summit Everest in 1975 as part of an all-women team, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we have Alison Hargreaves, who was recognized as the first person to solo climb all six of the great northern faces of the Alps and is credited with climbing Everest solo without oxygen or the support of a Sherpa. Um, I feel like without the oxygen thing... That's a huge shouldn't debate. That shouldn't happen. I, I have don't like know. I could go if this was a different podcast. I'd be talking about that. <laughs> I'd be talking about the dangers of descending. I'd be talking about ice glaciers. <laughs> like I'm telling you, <laughs> I just I feel like I get I get the like notoriety mm-hmm. to it, but I'm like, is it necessary? Is that okay? All right, all right, all right. I don't. I'm not a mountaineer. There's a whole lot of things I don't know, obviously. Uh-huh. I am a mere amateur hiker at best, probably just a walker. I don't know. <laughs> so she died on K2, one of the most dangerous summits in the world in 1995. Yeah, K2 and Annapurna are the two that are like tied for the most dangerous, I think. Or they go back and forth. Okay. This is the actual better news, okay? This one's actually (laughs) better. In 2006, Sophia Dannenberg became the first black woman to summit Everest. She said that at the time of her climb, quote, when I was at base camp, if there were 20 female climbers, there must have been 2,000 men. In mountaineering, generally, there aren't many women. But there are so few women on Everest, and it's not just the climbers. Almost all the Sherpas, guides, cooks, and staff are men. It's like being in a small town with almost no women, and if you're climbing, you're there for months. This macho climbing culture can be intimidating for women. Young women, including women of color, are bringing their values into climbing and demanding that things are different. It grows exponentially once it started. Mountaineering is kind of lagging behind, but the industry is starting to respond. She's also been very outspoken about her experience climbing as a black woman. Quote, There are a lack of role models for people of color in the climbing community. I also think that climbing is an indicator of lagging social economic issues in our country. People who climb big mountains are all the same. Well-educated, work at an engineering company from upper-middle-class families. Climbing is time-consuming and costly. No matter what anyone says about the metaphysical part of climbing, it's a selfish, non-productive activity. It's a hobby that takes up a lot of time. It's a selfish hobby. It's a hobby that I love. Some people don't have the privilege of not being productive. 
And then uh, further, I've noticed that when I've met people on my expeditions, they treat me with a level of respect because I treat them with respect. People in countries in South America, Africa, and Asia are so happy to see another brown person trekking and climbing. They don't make the normal assumptions of being a rich white man. People have offered me additional information and have showed me immense hospitality. And we're going to be talking about her a bit more in a second, but she's got a lot of great quotes. And she's also got a lot of great quotes about always being questioned as being an expert. Like they're Mm. always like, oh, it can't be you. But it is her. (laughs) You don't look like a climber. Right. Excuse me. What does Mm -hmm. that look like? Yeah. And I've been following, again, with the social medias, but Mm -hmm. a lot of hikers who uh, have been doing special episodes, I guess, or uh, doing specific things to show, showcase whether or not an area is safe for people of color, specifically black people. And I think that's a, a sad and necessary, both yeah. of those things. And uh, we've talked about that in, in travel-wise, but specifically for climbing uh, and for hiking and climbing and wilderness a type of things, talking about whether or not you are safe because we are more isolated. We've talked about that as a, a, an issue for women in general um, and for non-binary people. But for, you know, black, the black community, it's a whole different conversation, once again, whether it's welcoming Mm -hmm. in general. Um, And I I find that interesting because this is that conversation of like, yeah, it's kind of, for me, as a person of color, when I see all white people, don't get me wrong, I still have the privilege of not, uh, of being considered the model minority. Do I get some looks? Sure. But I don't get as much discrimination as a black person would. I I absolutely believe that. Um, And I've seen it, but it's still like the relief to see another person of color. We're kind of like, hi, oh, (laughs) you made it. So maybe this is a little, you know, like trying to give us each other a heads up. And Mm -hmm. yeah, it's definitely that conversation of who is welcome and who is seen as an expert because, well, Mm -hmm. you don't look like A, B, C, and D. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. I'm, I'm glad to hear they are making changes and bringing some good, good noted difference in uh, intersectional perspective. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Great quotes. She's also been very outspoken of like, we're going to, again, we're going to get to this more in a second, but like when she did this, it was pretty historic and really didn't make news and it should have. Right. Um, yeah. So. Of course. Yeah. And then we have Nimdoma Sherpa, who at the age of 17 became the youngest woman to summit Mount Everest in 2008. She grew up in a remote mountain village in Nepal, dreaming of climbing herself. And she said, quote, the Sherpa are known as mountain heroes, and I always wanted to live up to my name. And apparently she did. Mm-hmm. Good job. <laughs> hey, my God, what was I doing? Sitting on a butt. <laughs> Don't want to think about um, it. <laughs> <laughs> then we have Sarah Kumalo. Uh, Kumalo became the first Black African woman to summit Everest in 2019. Also, a lot of great quotes. Um, And then we did want to wrap up with some more modern news. In recent years, organizations run by women have come together to lead all women summits of Everest. One such group operates with a local Nepalese organization launched by Nepali entrepreneur Indira Bhatta. It employs all Nepali women as guides and provides funding for other local women to train as guides. And this is a pretty big deal because over of the over 22,000 guides in the country, less than 900 are women. It's pretty, it's a good earning. This is not a strict endorsement of this company or, again, of Climbing Everest, because I know that in itself is controversial, but just wanted right. to mention it. <laughs> right. Again, we always want to think about the environmental impact, yep. but that's not what we're talking about. Not but if today, you have something yes. that intrigues you, make sure you yes. do your research. Yes. Uh, and again, if you're thinking this has been a lot of white folks... You are correct. Though we don't want to erase what women of color have done, still, of the about 4,000 people who have summited Everest, only eight of them have been black. Again, there are some efforts to change that. And yeah, there are already people doing amazing things. Of course, just a reminder, so many conversations about this, but Mm -hmm. the opportunity, the affordability, accessibility, and probably just the overall racism can be factors Mm -hmm. or why this is. Um, And then one of these efforts, by the way, is a group of black climbers and mountaineers called Full Circle. In the words of a member, Rosemary Saul, it is an expedition that is certainly about climbing. 
It is about spending time in the mountains, but it's also about building community, global community. And it's about changing the narrative of the Black community, particularly in the United States and how we interact with outdoor spaces. Um, Yeah, and in 2022, they became the first all-Black team to summit Everest. There's also Brown Girls Climbing, which is a U.S. organization dedicated to introducing climbings to girls of color. And, you know, we've talked about the hiking experience, wilderness experience with other organizations and why this is important. Mm -hmm. that they are able to build that community. It's beautiful to see. Yes, and a good source to check out, uh, complete with people to follow on social media, uh, is melaninbasecamp.com. And then in 2021, Soraya Sarhadi Nelson, who is working on a book about uh, women Afghan climbers, reported on an Afghan mountaineering women's team stranded in Afghanistan after the U.S. left. Uh, When the Taliban was in charge previously, women and girls were not allowed to participate in sports. But in the post-Taliban era, they have fought to compete and they have had successes. Um, When the Taliban regained control, some started banning women from participating once again. And this team was trapped. Uh, it was a upsetting and a, a very informative article, but it was kind of using this team to look at what's going on in Afghanistan mm-hmm. at large for women. Right. Yeah, obviously, again, this is one of the big conversations of who has accessibility uh, mm-hmm. to doing these things and why the numbers for uh, those marginalized people are so low and how it's not their fault. Is literally society's fault. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, and definitely, like, not to harp on this point, but to harp on this point, like, as the climbing of mountains has become more commercialized, more and more people are doing it, and I'm happy to see, like, it's becoming more diversified, but as we've said throughout, do your research, because we've all, I think a lot of us have seen the pictures now of, like, the line to summit right. Everest and the trash that's everywhere. Like, right. if you're going to do it, I you have to be respectful, take care of the environment, think about what you're doing. Yeah. Right. And also, yeah, all that to understand that if Native people of that land are asking you something, not even asking you, but pleading with you yes. to not do something, let's listen. Mm-hmm. Let's listen. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, there's so many... Oh, there's so much we could talk about with this, but we're we gotta stay in our feminist. <laughs> it's hard because I want to talk about it, uh, but they those podcasts do exist, and um, there is so much information out there about this. And I am glad that I got to share some mountaineering. Such good information. <laughs> some I love mountaineering it. facts, except for the tragic you. bits. But you know, yes, it oh, happens. It does. That's what. The whole thing got started because I was just curious. <laughs> I was just curious. Well, if we have anybody in our audience who's a mountaineer, who has climbed some mountains, we would love to hear from you. Send uh, us pictures too. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. Send us pictures. <laughs> you can email us at Stephanie and MomStuff at iHeartMedia.com. You can find us on Twitter at MomStuff Podcast or on Instagram at Stuff I Never Told You. Thanks as always to our super producer, Christina. Thank you, Christina. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff I Never Told You is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 